A proud supporter of this program, Riverbend Food Bank's vision is a hunger-free Iowa and Illinois. Whelan Presley Funeral Home and Crematory has been serving Quad City families since 1889. Whelan Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds and are proud supporters of WQPT. The race for the 17th. Meet the two Republican candidates looking to face incumbent Congresswoman Sherry Bustos in November. This is a special edition of The Cities. Illinois voters head to the polls Tuesday for a number of county and state primaries, but perhaps the biggest race in western Illinois features the two Republicans who hope to represent the 17th Congressional District. They join me now to talk about their campaigns and the issues impacting western Illinois and the nation. And joining us is Esther Joy King, Bill Faywell, the candidates for the U.S. Congress on the Republican Party. Thank you both for joining us. Jim, it's such a great honor. And pleasure to be with you today. So tell me a little bit about why you're running and a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks Jim for the opportunity to talk with, with everyone. So my parents were Christian missionaries when I was a kid, so I actually grew up in a different country. I grew up in Mexico and after undergrad I moved to Kabul, Afghanistan to do human rights work. So the theme in my life uh, for most of my career has been service. And after coming back from Afghanistan, I became a lawyer. Then I became a lawyer in the United States Army. So I currently am a JAG officer in the Army. And I see running for office as the next level of service. Uh, with everything that's going on in our country, I see what's happening around me. And I say, you know, I'm capable. I have a lot to offer. I want to be part of the conversation and make a difference in politics. Bill Farewell, what's your story? Um, I lived in Galena for what, 23 years. Uh, this is my second time coming around uh, running for Congress. Um, our running this time, I got Esther to thank because we spoke earlier this summer and one of the first questions out of her mouth was, well, are you going to run? Uh, I said, well, I'm going to leave this up to you, Esther. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, here's what's important to the country. Right now, the government rules the people. That's not how our, con our Constitution has been set up. It's set up so that the people rule the government. And I went over the same thing I've been preaching uh, for 10 years. It's term limits, uh, audit of the Federal Reserve Bank, Transparency Act, and the RAINS Act to start pulling back the powers of the federal agencies and bring them back to the Congress where they constitutionally belong. And I, I said, if you'll embrace these and make them part of your uh, campaign, I says, I don't have to run. I said, I'll support you. And she told me virtually a quote unquote, and it's, uh, um, I probably can't do that because the party's backing me and I have to do what the party tells me to do. Well, before you get any further, yeah. let, 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 let's start with that. Is, that. is that in fact what was said? Jim, that is not what was said. But what I do believe is that this is the very representation of democracy at work. Uh, a race for who should represent this district on the Republican nomination is the very essence of voters deciding who they, who they want to represent them. So I'm proud and honored to be part of the system. And as Bill said, this is a, this is a question of whose ideas do the voters want to bring uh, to represent them in Washington, D.C. And you are a candidate of ideas. We know that from when you ran two years ago. And, and you mentioned the federal government and its role, and that's where I really want to start off, is because the biggest issue that's affecting us right now is the coronavirus outbreak. The World Health Organization now calling it a global pandemic. They have underlined the uh, severity of this. What is the role of the federal government when you're facing a health issue such as this? And do you think it is such, a, such an issue? Well, let, let's just go back because we we. I do want to move on. I, I really want to talk about issues, on, Bill. But this is important All right. because it shows who people are, are representing. I'm out there to represent the people, and this is exactly what I shared with you that Esther shared with me. In fact, she texted me later in July that I can't go with your program, so she doesn't support term limits. She doesn't support. Uh, an audit of the Federal Reserve Bank. And but I'm going to let her talk about what but, she supports and doesn't well, support, and no, I'll let no, you wait, talk about what you support and don't support. This is important because it's a conflict of interest, because she's ending up supporting the party. 
and not supporting the people. And this is the thing you'll see running through the difference between us, and because we don't agree on anything. Now, if you want to go back to uh, coronavirus, yeah, absolutely the federal government has a role, and the CDC has really dropped the ball really bad. Um, we should, they should have been having kits out there. The CDC was trying to create its own kit that would cover SARS, uh, bird flu, and uh, coronavirus 19, and it put them so far behind the eight ball that they're just starting to come out with uh, detection kits. In fact, out in Washington, a lab out there said, the heck with you, CDC, we're gonna go ahead and do our own thing. But is that a and criticism they, of whether or not the federal government was prepared for such an epidemic? Because in a way, that's what you're saying. Yeah, and they weren't, and they aren't. And we're going to, now that they're getting it online, we're going to see a huge increase. And they're talking about there are some uh, pandemic experts from Harvard that are saying that the United States is going to be like Italy is now within nine to 14 days. And you can see the impact. You know, it, it's, it's more than just the impact in health. It's, you see the impact in the markets. And I do want to get to that as yep. well. I definitely want to get to that. But let me start with the uh, impact so far, as far as what the uh, government response has been so far. Would you have liked to see more? Would you have liked to seen it early? And do you even think there is a problem? So yes, Jim, it is important that the federal government respond to what's happening uh, with the coronavirus pandemic. And coordinated action is so important on issues like this because if we work together to solve the problem, then we'll be able to prevent the spread. Uh, having state by state response or even local government by local government response can kind of get patchworked. So if we have the federal government really leading the way, that's very important in a response for an, uh, an issue like this so that we avoid hysteria. And I do believe that information is also really important in this this situation so the more educated and aware each of us can be on how do we respond what actions can we personally take to to prevent spread and and maybe it's canceling a, a trip to florida or a uh, making sure we're washing our hands and buying proper supplies so spreading information accurate information not misinformation i do jim i do think there's been an issue from the news media where they've they've attacked uh, the, the they've made this a political issue uh, and that's not helping anyone and so it's making sure that we are having a response that is coordinated to solve the problem and not making it a political attack against the president or uh, we've seen Democrats holding up the funding for for helping the CDC and all that just to make it a, a political game and that's not a good a good it doesn't help any any part of this but no matter what if, you, if you're going to criticize how the administration has handled anything it's going to end up being called a political comment so I mean it, it, you, you have to you have to hold an administration to to getting work done and, and being prepared for something like this wouldn't you agree yes and what actually happened the 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 president asked for an amount of money and Congress came back and criticized him for for not asking for enough and then they passed a bill on uh, flavored tobaccos and they didn't pass any funding for coronavirus and it took more weeks to get the proper funding and it, it's it's fairly obvious when you look at the plays that this is a political game playing that's happening in Washington DC and one big reason I'm running is so that we stop doing that and we start actually bringing practical problem solving and willingness to work across the aisle to get things done and it, this is a situation that really evidences the need for that. It also underlines and Bill you had yeah. touched upon this it also underlines the global impact of our economy and our society that uh, that a virus that has uh, uh, germinated let's say in China has now as you pointed out, impacted Italy, the eighth largest economy on earth. China, one of the largest economies on earth. What does that say about society as far as America's role in the world when an illness such as this is causing worldwide panic or uncertainty at least? Well, you, you know, people can go out and blame President Trump and there are, people are always gonna make a political attack. But the fact is, the federal government, and not so much the president, the federal government has gotten so large and so unwieldy because all these powers aren't in the realm of Congress that you got a situation like where CDC has completely dropped the ball. This is completely beyond 
you know, the control of the president. He says, hey, you guys are on this? Yeah, we're on it. You know, to a certain extent, you know, administrators have to rely upon what's there. So, yeah, the government, the federal government has really dropped the ball on this thing. And it, there, there's no excuse for it. And I think it goes back a lot to uh, the federal government trying to do too much. Because once this thing gets out of the box, and it's pretty much out of the box, you can do all you want at the local level. But if your hospital beds are being overflown uh, with uh, people that are ill, and you get to the part point where you're doing triage, trying to say, we can save this person, we can't save this person. That's a really bad situation. And that's the job of the federal government, specifically the CDC. And they have so many conflicts of interest because they have patents. And actually what they were doing, they were trying to create a patent on a test that they would benefit from. And so they were ignoring what was already out there. Now you go back to China. China already had a lot of these things available. They're coming out of India. Hey, we've got the test for this. But it wasn't being done. Not here in the United States on the sell up. Now it's happening. Now the impact on the market, you can see it. I mean, and that's what I wanted to talk about too, because sure. we're talking about the global impact, but we're also talking about commodities and people that flow past borders, which look is what also going to get to. Look what happened with oil. Uh, that's a good point too as well. And, and there's other factors in that as well. That's I understand that. But let's talk about, as you said, keeping it in a box, so to speak. Um, and that requires perhaps uh, 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 isolating people in this country and keeping other people out of this country. What do you think the federal government's role should be when you get something that is either a pandemic or is threatening to be such? Well, Jim, what you're touching on directly leads to talking about the southern border and the immigration policies and how, how we can see that we need to have an overhaul of our immigration system to help in situations like this so that we do have more control over when and how people come to our country. And so that starts with securing the border and then overhauling our immigration system so that people come here legally and that they have the proper medical treatments and the proper health protocols in place so that they can come and live uh, a, as part of society and really access the American dream, not so that they're, they're circumventing the system or having to live under the radar. Uh, but welcoming people to America to, who are bringing value and bringing diversity and richness to our, to our communities. Um, so I really believe that part of addressing situations like this on an ongoing basis is making sure that we have a healthy immigration system so that we can address situations like this. And it is good to pivot to immigration right now, and I did want to get to that because it's more than just building a wall, and you both have agreed to that. So tell me a little you know, bit. It, it, it's more than just the southern border. I mean, you have people coming around from the world. They don't come through the southern border, some do. But most of them are coming by airplane. And we, we don't have the protocol set up. They're not testing for even temperature. The people that come off the plane from the Far East, uh, from, any, from Italy, from the UK, it's not being done right now. Now, as far as immigration, Esther and I, don't see the eye to eye to eye on this at all. But let me ask you about your point on, on immigration, because what would you do, and, and I want to uh, 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 get more into what uh, Esther was saying as well, but what, what do you want to do with people who are declared illegal immigrants in our country right now? A, a path to citizenship, deportations, what do you want to see with the people who are already here? I think the main thing is that we've got to focus on is going to a merit-based system, and that uh, entails embracing the RAISE Act and stuff, just accepting anyone. You know, part of the problem with immigration right now is that because the federal government has taken over education since, what, 1988, the Department of Education, we've seen our science and math scores drop from the top five in the top 69 countries in the world to our math is 38 and science is about 28. And what we need to do is merit-based so that the people we allow in, and we've got plenty of unemployed people, but we need to start bringing in the scientists, the mathematicians, to start filling in that gap because, because of coronavirus and the, the impact of uh, parts for manufacturing here in the United States, about 80% of the companies are being affected by this. So you're going to see uh, a demand for manufacturing uh, pick up in the United States and so we, we don't have this vulnerability anymore. And to do that, you have to start 
okay, we've got enough of regular immigrants. We've got to stop the border. We've got to get much more selective on who we let into the country. And it's, it's, this goes back to the problem with so the how, department. Because uh, yeah. I want to ask you, because you both basically mentioned the same thing, and that was to be having a merit-based entry into America. No, I'm merit-based. She's not merit-based. You did use the word merit, actually. Yeah, no, so, I did. So, That's so, insane. So my, question, I so my question is, I mean, what would that entail? I mean, you'd have to have a test or a background, and, and how, how do you determine the merit of a child that would be with a family? Well, they might come along with the family if it's a... a a husband or a wife that have the education. But just like in New Zealand, you come through, and if you want to emigrate to New Zealand, you got to go through a checklist and see if you qualify for a number of jobs that they're looking for. Sure. And if you do, they'll start the process. Do you think that is somewhat inherently un-American, though? I mean, the, no, no, no. Because think of the 1800s and the early 1900s with immigration. I mean, that wasn't done then. No, but it has done in between. It, we've, been, we've gone from being very selective to opening the doors to anyone. And we can't do that anymore. I mean, we might have 3.5% unemployment, but that's still about 90,000 people that are unemployed that are employable. So we really don't need uh, uneducated workers anymore. So uh, as, as cruel as it may sound, we've had that policy since the 60s. That has to stop, and we have to start shifting over to a merit-based and more selective uh, uh, Means of entry, yes. Yeah. And, and, and you had brought it up as well. I mean, how, how would the system work that would make you uh, support it? Well, I have a story around immigration that's very personal for me, Jim. So my sister met and fell in love with a gentleman who was here in the United States illegally. And they decided together, they said, you know, we want to live our, our lives above board. We don't want to be hiding from the law. So they got married, but then he, he turned himself in was deported to Mexico, and they went through the immigration process. So I saw firsthand how hard it is to come to our country for people that are bringing value, adding value to our economy, to our communities. And uh, I got those late night calls where my sister said, Esther, you're a lawyer, help me figure out this immigration process. So what I believe is we need to overhaul our legal immigration processes so that they're customer friendly, so that we're welcoming people into our country that are going to add value to our communities. And yes, that does mean we're bringing people with skills that are going to enrich our economy, that we're, we are connecting people to jobs when they come here and meeting needs of American business and American uh, communities so that we are connecting the dots for people so that they do have the greatest chance of success when they come to America. So what do you say to those people who have come here and are now, let's say, labeled as illegal immigrants that are gainfully employed, that are yeah. adding value yeah. to our society? What do you say to them? Get out or, or, yeah. or what's the process? Well, practically, Jim, if you, if you look around, we all are connected with these people, whether we understand that or not, whether it's we meet them in the store and they're, they're bagging our groceries or they're building our homes. There's so many connection points that we all have, or there, a lot of us have family members that have come to the country in different ways. And so how do we allow them to come to our country and facilitate their process of being here fairly? Because there are many people that are coming to our country legally and we don't want to discredit them or disadvantage them because they are doing it the right way. So figuring out a, a merit-based system where they do have access and they can apply for green cards and citizenship uh, so that they have a, the ability to be in our country and keep doing what they're doing and being part of, of enriching us and in, in making America a better country. Yeah, Jim, it's not supposed to be easy. You know, in fact, in the last, since 2010, we have doubled the number of foreign-born voters here in the United States. And I think people have a generally have a problem with that. I know I do. We've gone from like uh, 10 million to 20 million. And if you go back to uh, the year 2000, it's a much, much larger number than that. It's not supposed to be easy. We're not supposed to take everyone. If you go to every other country, if you want to go move from America and live in, and become a citizen of Mexico, you have to learn the language. You have to jump through a lot more hoops than you do have to get into the United States. And a lot more people want to get into the United States than want to get into Mexico, believe me. And it's supposed to be hard. And it should be hard. And I think we should continue to make it hard. 
I want to move on to farm and trade. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest, the biggest industry in this area is farming. Farmers were hit quite a bit by a trade war, mm -hmm. as well as falling prices on commodities. Uh, the Trump administration had helped as much as they had, could, that is. USDA paid farmers $23 billion to offset their losses. Do you think that was a proper thing for taxpayers to pay for? Some would call it a bailout for farmers. Jim, I get to go talk to farmers every day, and I've had many, many farmers say, you know, Esther, I, I probably wouldn't have made it this year because of all the flooding, because of everything that happened. I wouldn't have made it without the additional help. So I think it was a, it was a positive thing, but is that always gonna be the solution? Absolutely not. So I do believe that we did a great thing by getting the USMCA passed. It was delayed, again, we were talking about political games earlier, it was delayed by political games for an entire year. But now we have this trade deal in place that is really going to help our economy because Canada and Mexico are two of our biggest trading partners. And we've, we've done the same thing uh, in negotiating with China. We are now holding China accountable thanks to President Trump's policies. And that is good for farmers. It benefits us. And yes, they did take it on the chin for the economy uh, to a certain extent. And that's, we gotta make sure that we have a voice in the conversation, a voice at the table when trade negotiations are happening so that farmers are protected. Uh, but trade deals that President Trump are, is leading on are spectacularly excellent for the Illinois 17th Congressional District. Let, let's hear from you yeah. as well. I mean, that, yeah, that, 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 that's not the case. I mean, in a perfect world. But look what's happened with coronavirus. All of a sudden, they've got these new deals with China. And China's always been a very unreliable trading partner. And you, you see this frequently in communist governments. I mean, when I worked at the Board of Trade in the Burke back in the 70s and 80s, you'd see uh, Russia come in where the grain was at its very lowest price and scoop a bunch up. In fact, if you look at the price of corn and beans today, they're, they're virtually on their lows. And it's been like that since 2014. And as far as coming in with a program, I can understand the first time coming in and doing something with farmers. Hey, we're going to bail you out. But I think you have to have something more structured that's long term. You know, back in 19, up until 1972. Well, you have the farm bill. You have the farm bill, but up until 1972, we had a grain reserve in this country, biblical in wisdom and designed to take care of, you know, if you have a major climate change uh, problem where you have a crop failure, which is absolutely possible today. I mean, climate change does happen. It's happening today. It's been going on for millions of years. Not that it's man-made, but it does occur. Now, if you, my, I've got a, a bill that I've, I've proposed and I've written. It's called the Flyover America Act. And the first part of it is to reestablish that grain reserve. This would, it would be virtually cost free because the government would be going in and buying grain with money that they're paying 1% or less on. So they can buy up a lot of grain and that would raise the price of a buck. Huge for the farmer. The next step is it, where does it go? It's going to have to go into newly made silos that are going to be built in the Midwest, uh, in the farming areas, and those, it has to be, uh, in my Flyover America Act, has to be on owner-occupied farmland or co-op-owned farmland so the big banks don't get their hands into it. Okay. The second part of that... Make it quickly, please. second part of that is the Volunteer Fire Department Act. Which because you have to have, you just can't come into the Midwest or the grain areas and expect to get support for Congress to get that through. But if you add the Volunteer Fire Department Act, and we have a huge problem in our volunteer fire departments now because they, they can't make ends meet and they can't volunteer anymore. And that brings in 95% of the land mass of the United States. All of a sudden, you've got the kind of numbers in Congress you need to get the whole thing passed. And that goes back to, you know, I got to cut yeah. you off. Okay, okay, so those are your two major issues that you think are important in if elected Huge. in farming. And, and tell me what your two main priorities, if elected, would be. Jim, certainly trade deals and making sure that we are uh, well positioned with our trading partners across the globe. The Illinois 17th has, a, has an opportunity to truly lead, uh, particularly on environmental issues. So making sure we're positioning the ag industry to step, step into that leadership and continue to lead. We're already leading on so many of these issues. Uh, and secondly, certainly repairing locks and dams. Infrastructure is so important for getting our food to the world. And so bringing in an infrastructure package that will actually help 
the renew the locks and dams, rebuild, and uh, update and innovate on infrastructure. Are you worried, though, that the Trump administration had called for cuts as far as the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is in this latest budget? So you're right that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is in charge of the constructions of locks and dams, but I've worked as a JAG officer in the Army. I have worked with the Army Corps of Engineers, and I'm fully confident that they are going to be able to continue to work on projects, uh, even if there's there are cuts. The, the Army Corps of Engineers is very effective and can, we can make fixing our locks and dams here in this area a top priority. I'm excited to, to work on that when I'm representing the Illinois 17th. All, all that bid work, is, it's the little bit, you understand that? Federal government? And, yeah, and I, I don't well, agree with that. I, I think pulling money from the locks and dams because if you look, if you're a farmer in North Carolina, you don't get your grain from the Midwest. You get it from France because they can put it in a boat and send it over. That's what makes the United States such a powerhouse in grain and foods because we have the Mississippi, we have the Missouri. And trying to save a couple bucks there is really short-sighted, especially when you consider you know, the, the climate change problems we're having. You know, I fully expect you know, a few more floods to come our way here in the Mississippi, and that costs money to prepare for that. And trying to nickel and dime that infrastructure improvements. I don't care if the Army Corps can walk on water. It, it's, it's a, foolish, it's a fu foolish way to save money. Bill Faywell, Esther Joy King, we've run out of time. I appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you so much to your Republican candidates Thanks for, for the 17th us. Congressional appreciate District. It. Jim, thank you so much for having us. Absolutely. Now, in a moment, what you can expect come Election Day, Tuesday across Illinois. But first, getting ready to be counted. Very soon, you'll be asked to be taking part in the U.S. Census. What is the 2020 Census? Every 10 years, the Census records everyone living in this country. It's written in the Constitution and comes in a questionnaire that counts everyone who lives at your address on April 1st. The data can be used to inform funding for services like fire stations, schools, clinics, and representation that affect your community. Shape your future. Start here. Visit 2020census.gov. Thank you for joining us for the cities, and we hope you do get out and vote Tuesday in the Illinois primary. Now, each community has a number of issues on the ballot, whether it's your selection of candidates or a decision on a local referendum. Tuesday is your chance to take a stand. Polls across Illinois open at 6 in the morning and stay open until 7 at night. On the air, on the radio, on the web, and on your mobile device, thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. A proud supporter of this program, Riverbend Food Bank's vision is a hunger-free Iowa and Illinois. Wheeland Presley Funeral Home and Crematory has been serving Quad City families since 1889. Wheeland Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds and are proud supporters of WQPT.